In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I can't stand watching a movie, a TV show, or reading a book whose ending I can figure out within the first five minutes. I like surprises. That's why reading the Bible is so much fun. No one would have ever predicted the outcomes we read about in the Gospels after reading Genesis. The Bible might have the greatest holy cow moment in all literature, and the whole thing hangs on these questions. Who is the Messiah? And who is going to fix this mess that we found ourselves in? Today's gospel lesson comes right after the Emmaus Road interaction. Remember that story. Cleopas and another disciple of Jesus were walking to Emmaus from Jerusalem, and Jesus appeared to them as they walked, but they didn't recognize him. So they told Jesus about the events of his own death. And Luke tells us that Jesus, on this walk, interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Immediately following the Emmaus story, Jesus appeared to them again and again. Luke tells us, Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures. What Jesus said to them opened up the Old Testament so that they understood who Jesus is and who their Messiah is. The message changed their perspective and enabled the apostles to begin the church. What did the word Messiah mean for a first century Jew? And what did Jesus teach the apostles in his resurrection appearances that introduced them to a new understanding of Messiah? Messiah literally means anointed one. There are numerous messianic figures in the Old Testament, King David being the most obvious one. And David was indeed anointed by God and with the Holy Spirit. David was, for a first century Jew, the definitive Messiah. However, there are many other messianic figures throughout the Old Testament. Abraham, Melchizedek, Moses, Deborah, Barak, and Ruth are all messianic figures. They all do their part to protect and to save Israel, and they were all anointed by God for something special. The apostles expected Jesus to be more like these Old Testament messianic figures. After all, Jesus was anointed in his baptism by the Holy Spirit, and he was sent from God. Reading the Bible backwards can reveal what Jesus taught his disciples and how he opened the scriptures to them. What I mean by that is that we must read the Old Testament through the lens of Jesus Christ and what we know about him. Richard Hayes' book, Reading Backwards, does just this. And he makes the case that Luke uses three verses in his gospel from Isaiah and his interpretation to reveal who the Messiah really is. Now, each one of these verses from the prophet Isaiah begins with this. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer the Holy One of Israel. Isaiah rightfully names not people as the Redeemer, but God himself. Isaiah promises that God is the Redeemer of Israel. 
What Jesus reveals to his disciples in his resurrection appearances in Luke must have been that while God has anointed messianic figures throughout history from Abraham on, those who he anointed were not the ones who were saving Israel. The whole time, it was the word of God himself through whom all creation was made who was also to redeem his creation. His saving deeds are shown in the Old Testament, but who he is is revealed in Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Redeemer. The true Messiah of Israel, of the world, isn't a man or a woman whom God anoints. The Messiah is the very word of God himself, Jesus. If we go back and reread all the heroic stories of the Old Testament, what we realize, what Isaiah tells us, and what Jesus shows us is that God himself is the Redeemer. The Messianic figures like Abraham, Melchizedek, Moses, Deborah, Barak, Ruth, and David are the mouthpiece or the catalyst that God uses for his saving actions. It's not those individuals who are saving Israel. It's God. The Messiah cannot simply be a man. He must be the incarnate word of God. This truth, revealed to the apostles by Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit, set the world on fire and establishes Christ's bride, the church, of which we are all members. If we want to know our Redeemer better, we must do all we can to steep ourselves in Scripture. Reading Scripture is the most intimate way to get to know God. It is the record of all of his redeeming acts. Reading Scripture helps us see how God is the author of our redemption and how God has acted throughout history. All this talk about redeeming and redemption... Redemption has two definitions, a theological definition and a secular one. The theological definition is the action of saving or being saved from sin, error, or evil. The secular definition is the action of regaining or gaining possession of something in exchange for payment or clearing a debt. Both definitions apply to Jesus. We are his. We're not our own. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection clear humanity's debt. Good way of putting it, so that we can all understand, is that Christians are the ultimate trust fund babies. <laughs> the owner of our trust is God himself, Jesus, our Messiah. We cannot incur a debt too large that he, when asked, cannot or will not repay. It's up to us to ask, however, and to thank him for the payment he continually offers on our behalf. Jesus offers that payment with only one term. 
that we love him. That we love him. Loving Jesus means we want to maintain a relationship with him by praying, by reading scripture, by being in church every Sunday, and by loving our neighbor. Contemplate redemption today. Consider the one who created you is also the one who has redeemed you. I believe that realization makes this Easter season even more sweet than it already was. And it makes all the alleluias that we sing throughout this season even more glorious. Alleluia.